sanitizer. Uh, good day once again. Guys, I know when you when you finish to eat, you are tired. But uh, let's focus. Uh, let's drink water at least to gain some power. How are you feeling now? How are you feeling now? You know, since it's the last day, have you get some few points that you know you're gonna work on during the week, like after today? A week and not a month. There are content creators here. Is there any content creator here? Content creator. We don't have one. Content creator is a anything that you have in mind. But you were lost. <laughs> uh, I know, I know you. You may be feeling like tired or dizzy, but let's get starting. I'm going to allow Mr. B to introduce our guest for the session that we're gonna have now. Hallelujah. Always feels like church up in here on a Sunday. Should I use which one? This one? Or should I use oh, it's battery? Just take it there for him to change the battery. <sighs> Are we live? Waiting for a signal, sir. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to <laughs> this. Could be a go change battery that side, my brother. Yes, sir. Welcome to the last official. A workshop, or what you call these seminars, ne? Yes. After this, we still have the closing night film. Okay. So this is this is it. This is the last time you see me talking in front of you. So I know some of you are now tired of this one, but not as much as the MC is right. Okay. So without any wasting of more time, I want to introduce uh, a good friend of ours. Um, <laughs> this when a new it 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 takes quite some time to master how to pronounce it so there's a school that you must go to to learn how to promote to pronounce it right we had some trouble even him here to coach people and explain to people this is how you pronounce it so uh, so some sometimes it would be Nyef. some people will say Nyef. <laughs> a whole lot of different types of, of um, explanations. But uh, I am very proud of um, Noel and his team. Sterling, beautiful team, very energetic, doing amazing things. This man and his team, they gave me the most amazing imagine of a festival I ever, ever experienced. Someone is support touching my mic, but it's fine, I understand. So. Uh, was it last year, right? Was it twin the the 3D one? It was last year. See, I even know his festival better than him. So, <laughs> last year, 
there was a delivery to my house, a little kitiki thing, ne? and inside was a pair of goggles, 3D goggles, VR. Th v v VR, what? Please. VR 360. VR 360. Inside. Headset. Inside a, a pack. And uh, some few things that I don't want to mention because we are live. Uh, some sweets that I can mention. And a beautiful badge because new stands for environmental preservation. So even the badge, they don't use it. He's very irritated, I know, to see this here. But you will understand. We'll, uh, we'll talk. I'll let you know why this, this year, okay? So then the idea of that particular festival is that you wear the, the, uh, the VR goggles, right? And you get inside a world, unbelievable world. You pick your clothes. You pick an avatar. So you have got a, a um, what do you call that thing? Avatar. Am I right to call it avatar? It's an avatar. You dress it, you say, I want a pink shirt, I want this, I want this. You can even dress like, like Prince with a, a pink T-shirt. <laughs> you see, in that world, you are not limited. You can be whoever you want to be. So you wear this thing, and then it's got this little thing here on the, on the thing, which responds live to what you're doing in, the, in, in your space. So this thing is moving inside. You shake people's hands. Like, I can't believe this. Oh, and you're attending seminars. You just, the joy about it. I, lo I love this the most. This is the one platform I have, my friend. I have to say this. There's a function called teleporting. You could in there decide where you want to be. So like right now, I could decide I want to be in Kingsgate 2. And I go, and then, No, I tell you, it's, it's beautiful. So all those are experiences that are important. I think as, as filmmakers, we need to be exposed to all those things and know that there is a world, there's a VR world, there's, and it's getting hectic because Facebook has released new technologies called, what is it, Meta, 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 Metaverse, you see? So it's changing. The way we are consuming content is changing. Come three years into this world, I, you, you will see what will be happening, okay? So I don't want to ramble and ramble and ramble because it's not my session, okay? I was just appetizing you, waking you up so that that pup that you just got kind of like settles. Yeah. So thank you so much. Um, I want to introduce Noel and his team. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. B, thank you so much. Mola, so good to see you, my friend. Um, Mr. B and Kia, you know, I thought you were my friends, okay? But you, you know, I mean, which friends invite you to come and talk on the last day after lunch? Uh, everyone's about to sleep. Everyone is tired. Plus, they could have told me it's 142 degrees outside. I would have came with shorts. Uh, it's burning here. <laughs> Only if you have a friend, Noel, <laughs> who's got such amazing energy, and you know there's no way anyone can sleep past Noel. Exactly. So, but don't worry. I've got weapons. Okay? I came here with prizes. I came here with things to give you so that you all can stay awake. Okay? And I hope to keep this as exciting and as um, impactful as, as possible. And I hope that you get out of this as much as we do. When I say get out of it, as much as we do, it's really a pleasure and an honor to be here. We run an organization called NUF, Nature, Environment, and Wildlife. Change from filmmakers to filmmaking. Um, and I'm going to play you a video now that kind of introduces who we are as an organization and, and our event and uh, tells you a little bit of our story. And after that, I will tell you a little bit more of our story just to kind of give you some context before I go into some of the things that we do. Okay? Um, so if we can play the introduction video.
Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story just to give you some background as to how we got here. Um, they say in Africa, the first time you see a rhino, it'll stay with you for the rest of your life. I remember when I saw my first rhino. I was about five or six years old, playing in a dusty car park there in Durban, KwaZulu-Natal. Um, I was playing with a brick outside and in the car park, and this lady walked down with her two daughters. Uh, and as they got near their car, I greeted her. And she stopped, she smiled. She gave me 20 cents. And I thought I was the richest oak on the planet, okay? That was the most amount of money I'd ever seen in my life. And as she drove off, um, there it was, at the back of the car, a bumper sticker that said, Save the Rhino. I'd never seen a rhino up to point. I had never known that it existed. I didn't know anything about it. But as she drove off, suddenly, I now, that I felt like I was connected to that rhino. And so every time and everywhere I went, I started looking for that bumper sticker on the cars. The lady who gave me 20 cents was white. And the reason why I say that is, every time I did see that bumper sticker on the cars, the people inside the car were always white. So as a little kid, this is the late, mid to late 1970s. As a little kid, in my mind, I thought, well, okay, hold on. This is a white people's thing. It's not ours. It was also the middle of apartheid. So in my mind, I couldn't understand why would they care about an animal more than they care about us, okay? But that rhino stayed with me, okay? Because, and you know, every time I looked on TV, Every time I saw anything to do with conservation or with rhinos, we as black people were always only driving the cars, pulling things, the guards, or singing for people when they jumped off their safari vehicles. And so it, it kind of bothered me. And you know, I, I honestly believed it wasn't our thing. The very first time or opportunity that I managed to get any money, I wanted to go and see why would somebody care more about an animal than they did about us? Okay, and the first chance I had, I went to Kruger National Park about 20 years after that incident. And when I got there and I saw the rhino in the flesh for the first time, I understood. I understood when I looked at how amazing and how magic and how beautiful it looked, I understood. But at the same time, when I was walking around, when driving around the park, Again, I was the only black person there, okay? The rest were all only working or driving or changing the bedding or cooking, okay? And if you looked on television, okay, it was only 50-50 in Afrikaans, okay? Uh, that's the only time you would see any wildlife content if you didn't, and those days National Geographic wasn't there yet, okay? Fast forward 20 years later, I was at a television, I, I was at the airport, I'd come for a meeting up in Johannesburg and I missed the flight. And I was sitting there and I saw this big bedazzled rhino at the airport and I thought, what's this doing here? And I went up and I went to read. And that's when I discovered that the rhino were in trouble again. And that there was a big rhino poaching crisis that was happening. And so, I looked at this and I thought, you know, this is great. For the rhino, it's, it's great for fundraising because people are coming through here and they're seeing this. But the rhino are being poached in rural areas. And most of the people in that live next to those parks, they don't fly. So how's that message getting to them? And so at that point, I sat down and I had like four hours in my hand and I wrote a concept for a television series because, and I wanted to write a concept aimed at SAPC one. And I wrote a TV series in Zulu to SABC and I presented to, to them and when they saw me, 
walk in and they saw the picture of the rhino. They said, oh, SABC3. I said, no, SABC1. And the words were, conservation for black people? How's that going to work? And I said to them, you know, as black people, we have always lived the closest to the natural rhythms and ways of being. We have always been connected to nature. It's in our surnames. It's who we are. Okay? For some reason, somebody came and took that narrative away and changed it and made it seem as if white people were the saviors of wildlife and of our natural heritage and our natural habitat. We are the ones, <coughs> excuse me, we are the ones that have always protected it. And yet, we were excluded from those particular stories. And so, we convinced them. I think partly because we had celebrities in the first segment of the, of the TV series. Um, and, and, and again, with that, I wanted to prove to them that there were black A-list celebrities out there who want to be associated with this, who are passionate about wildlife. I mean, our celebrity lineup in our TV program back then ha started with Pearl Tusi, um, um, Nomzama Mbata, um, I'm just trying, Palance and Stumo, even Spinach and, um, you know, um, that's just a few of them that I'm mentioning, okay, who were prepared to come and do it because they cared and they, they were passionate about protecting the natural habitat. So we did this TV series and it absolutely bankrupted us, okay? Two reasons. One, we didn't know what we were doing. Two, um, access to wildlife was one of the biggest challenges we faced. And I mean, it sounds crazy that black people struggle to get access to wildlife, but that's a fact. How many of you and how, how many of you have been into a park? And Northwest has got amazing parks. How many of you have been in it? Okay. Less than 10% of the room. Do you know what I'm saying? In, in the Northwest parks. And you are blessed with the most unbelievable park in the country. Okay. So, instead... So, so what we realized, right? So one, like I said, we didn't know what we were doing. Two, access to wildlife was one of the hardest things. And we thought to ourselves, film and television is booming all across Africa. How come all the kids that come out of university, that come out of film school, that come out of everything, all they want to do is make uzalo and music videos and nothing else, okay? How come they not wanting to make, we, when, when we were making our TV series, we were the only black people in the industry, okay? When we used to go and go and film in those reserves, it almost felt, they looked at us so strange, they were like, are these guys coming to film the rhino or steal it, okay? Because they had never seen us there before, okay? It was, it was strange, okay? But just realize why. Um, it made us realize why so many young kids come straight out of university and go straight in wanting to do all these other, other genres and don't come into this. But, guys, there they, they are serious opportunities in this. So, instead of um, walking away with our tails between our legs, we decided to start new. Okay? At that point, this is back in 2017, at that point people said to us, you know, there was a lot of debate about whether we should have a um, film festival or whether we should be a congress. And when we discussed the film festival idea, we said, but hold on, whose films will we show if we have a film festival? It's only going to be international white people's films that we're going to show. We're not going to show ours, okay, because there were none of us making this content. Okay, and so we decided that we were going to start a congress that would develop the industry and try and attract young people um, into coming into this industry. Okay, last year when Mr. B was telling you, uh, last year when we had our congress in the middle of COVID, um, whilst um, we were having the congress on Channel 180, the pe uh, People's Weather Channel, we had 
our own new f- film festival of short films that we have funded since 2017 until now by young filmmakers, which would show you, uh, which I'm going to show you some a bit later on. Okay, but we had uh, to date we have got 20 short films that we have pr- that we have funded and 10 micro films that we have funded over this particular period of time. But now we can showcase our own films. And so many of these films are made by young, black, African filmmakers, are made by young, black, African scientists. Scientists who are saying, but hold on, I'm working in this field. How do I tell the stories? How do I tell the stories of my work? Okay, two of the films that you'll watch today are made by young marine biologists. Okay, who work in the ocean space, who work with communities in the ocean space. Okay, and they came to our Congress and they pitched their ideas. Okay, and um, that is how, th- and they, they went funding to produce their short film. But we don't just say, yes, the money, go off and go make the film. No, we take them through a, um, a mentorship program where there's somebody that carries them right through the year in terms of making sure that their story is strong, that they, if they are not a cinematographer or a filmmaker, okay, we make sure that we pair them with a proper filmmaker that can t- deliver the right quality, you know, that, that kind of stuff. So what turned out to be an annual congress back in 2017 has now grown into being an all year round impact and outreach um, organization we have a community cinema division. We have uh, that thing at the bottom says New Development Fund. It's actually been changed. Now it's New Labs, where we train and build capacity amongst filmmakers and opportunity for them within this particular uh, genre of filmmaking. You know, Africa is surrounded by 30,000 kilometers of coastline. Okay. Back in 2018, we were wanting to have a panel that explores whether we as Africans are using that coastline as uh, a resource. Are we using it to tell enough stories? Are there, what are the stories that are connected to our, you know, our history, our culture, our, you, you know? And, you know, we we just naively decided that, okay, we put a panel together. We said, okay, we're going to put at least one or two black African underwater filmmakers on the panel. <laughs> Shame. We looked the whole continent full. We couldn't find one. There are black African divers, but anybody, di- any filmmakers? None at all. Okay. 30,000 kilometers of coastline. 38 countries out of the 54 have got coastlines. And we are not telling those stories. Okay? It's crazy. But when you look at that diving, you know, number one, you know, swimming is a challenge. Okay? It's a big challenge. Okay? Access to that gear, the diving gear is another big challenge. All right? We all go to the beach, you know, twice a year. Well, we used to. Uh, okay, yeah, for you guys, it's once. <laughs> okay, for us in Durban, it's a lot easier. But, you know, in the, but traditionally, even in Durban, we would live 10 kilometers away from the beach, but we'd only go there twice a year. Okay? And then they still call us names when we go there. Okay? Let's not go down that road. <laughs> okay, but... Um, do you know what I'm saying? So we, we said, okay, what do we do? All right, so we started something what we call new dive labs, where we pay, we fi- find funding, we raise money to take, um, I don't know, you saw that in the opening film where you saw some of the uh, uh, young filmmakers, those who were just first year coming out of, out of film school. This past uh, March until July, we took 10 women from around South Africa and Africa to uh, one woman was from Northwest um, to go and dive to become dive masters. And that dive master qualification allows you to go and dive anywhere and lead dives anywhere in the world. Okay, but it's a whole three month intensive 
diving thing. The, the woman from Northwest that I'm mentioning, on Friday, there was one, one of the um, scientists, she's a scientist, and there was another scientist from Tanzania who was also in the lab. When they, both ca when they came there, they both could not swim. Okay? On Friday, there was a picture of them in Zanzibar. They are leading a project of restoring coral reefs in, Z in Zanzibar at the moment. This is less than three months later from when they became dive masters. Okay? And that's the thing. When you give an African child access and opportunity, okay, there's nothing that we cannot do. Okay? And so the reason why we are here today is we want you to come and talk and speak about what we do as an organization, but we also want to inspire you guys as young filmmakers to say there is a genre that is waiting out there for you. There is a genre that you are actually so connected to that you don't even realize, okay? There's a genre that makes you, gives you such an advantage because you can go home to elders who can tell you stories who can tell you historical and culture, culturally rich heritage stories that you can add into your, you know, into the films and the stories that you make, okay? And we are trying to encourage as many young people as possible to come and be a part of it. I'm going to show you a clip now of a young lady who I met four months ago. She lives in Sodwana Bay in... KwaZulu Natal. Okay, it's a it's about an hour away from Mozambique. She can't swim, um, but at least she had. When I met her, she the only re reason I met her was she was she had gone to a dive operator and asked for swimming lessons because she wanted to find out. Okay, she lives right next to a park. She had never seen. She had never been in it. She lives less than 10 kilometers away from a park. She had never been in it. She had just come back from university, having achieved a diploma, and, and, and now she was sitting at home and thinking, and now what? Okay? Just the act of going to try and get swimming lessons is what opened up this opportunity for her. Let me play it for you, and then I'll tell you more about it. Bonani. Welcome to Dugu Dugu Gate, Western Shores, St. Lucia. I am Nolo Antentuli, and this is your weekend weather for Isimangaliso Wetland Park. Paul's climate change remains a point of discussion at COP26 this weekend. One thing you can be assured of is that our natural habitats, wetlands, and unique ecosystems have a positive impact on global warming. Supporting the continued protection of these natural wild spaces can reverse the harmful effects of climate change. Here is your weekend weather. Mkuza is hot, with the possibility of showers on Friday and Saturday, slightly cooling down in overcast conditions on Sunday. It's sunny and warm with gentle breezes in Kosi Bay this weekend, with chances of thunderstorms in the afternoons. It's a warm start for St. Lucia and Eastern Shores, cooling down with rain and thunderstorms on Saturday and Sunday. Sotwana Bay. Expect warm temperatures throughout the weekend, with chances of thunderstorms and rainfall on Friday and Saturday. Imagine wandering all over the world's oceans, but when it's time to give birth, you will swim thousands of kilometers back to the beach where you were born to lay your eggs. Yes, it's turtle season in Isimangaliso Wetland Park. And log ahead and leatherback mother turtles 
are arriving daily to begin their breeding process. After that long journey, they begin the hard task of digging their nest to lay their eggs safe from predators. Approximately 70 days later, the miracle of life begins as the hatchlings emerge from these nests and are guided by the moonlight into the ocean. Come learn more and witness this amazing cycle of life that occurs each year between October and April in our place of miracle and wonder, the Isumangaliso Wetland Park. And for a more detailed weather forecast, visit www.peoplesweather.com and click on the Isumangaliso tab. And now, it's time to meet the locals. Sorry, I cut it short uh, by the part where she says it's time, because after that's like another three minutes where they write uh, a story about a particular animal. Okay? Um, I cut it short just because we started late, so I'm just trying to catch up a little bit. Okay? But... That young lady wrote most of what you okay? She had never even dreamed of becoming a presenter. She went and she studied IT. She had never, even, she had never dreamed of becoming a presenter. She had never dreamed of being able to write, okay? The only thing that she did was go and look for swimming lessons. And I was saying to the dive operator that we, so she's a team, one of a team of four who live in Sedona Bay and they have their own media team. They go to schools and they play mostly the new films at the schools in Sedona Bay. They shoot um, a weekly weather insert that plays on People's Weather Channel every week plays to, gets broadcast to 12 Southern African countries. It's on ETV Open View and on, P and on DSTV, okay? The reason why I'm pointing that out is it's a genre that she never even, f firstly, she didn't even think she could be in film and television, number one. Number two, it's a genre that they didn't even think of, okay? Two weeks ago, Three, week, three weeks ago when we were doing a lab with scientists and they heard her story, they wanted to tell her story in the short film that they were doing. She took her 60-year-old father into the park for the first time in his life. Okay? You see his face when he saw an elephant for the first time in his life. Yet they live 10 kilometers away from there. Okay? And the power and the magic and the, the, the change that this can do, okay, is part of the message that I want to bring here today, okay? So there's an opportunity that we've created with um, People's Weather and the Simangalisa Wetland Park. We'd love to try and maybe, Kia, we could use this as a presentation to Northwest Parks and get a team here in this area to do a weekend, a weekly weather from, from the park, you know, and it's four people that are employed, you know, and there's four people that are in that area that are employed and they, it's, it's a concept that's developed and they, they broadcast every single week, you know. Um, the other thing is they get taught, if you look at the end where she spoke about the turtles, it's a two minute clip. But she had to go and research. She had to look at footage that we had and then write to that. You know, it's, it's, it's inspiring that creativity. It's like, how do, because very often with wildlife, you've got to write. Very often you film the animal behavior and then you go back and then you write. Okay? You don't, you can, you know, be very careful. Don't think you can control the script with animals. They don't read it. Okay, <laughs> all right, they, you think you're going to go do what you want to do, they'll decide how they're going to do things. They don't read the script. They're very rude that way, <laughs> okay? So, um, 
but but that's that's an example of what I'm trying to show you in terms of the the transformative power of this particular content and the opportunities that exist within it. Okay, um, so like I said earlier, we looked at this and we said, okay, um, how do we, you know, if if we were going to have a a film festival, whose films will we show? And so we said, what do we do to get our own films funded? And so we started in the first year, as part of the funding that we applied for, we asked, we, we went and we raised 200,000 Rand, and we said, we started a thing called the New Pitch, okay, where we invited young people under 35 to come and pitch an idea about a story that they want to tell, a short story, anything between 8 and 12 minutes long, a short film about the environment, the envir um, you know, environmental uh, uh, issues, wildlife, um, whether it be wildlife, whether it be environmental issues, whether it's about recycling, whether it's, you know, nat just, just about natural habitats, um, we invited them to come and pitch. They pitch in front of a live audience. They win 50,000 Rand to make their first film. But like I say, they go through a one year internship. They take one year to make that short film. Because, and then they even get paid the way you would get paid if you apply to the NFEF. So if you apply to the NFEF for production, um, uh, they pay you in tranches. Okay, and we explain that whole process because what we're trying to do is make you understand the way the industry works. The way, you know, you say my budget is two million, doesn't mean somebody's saying, right, she has your money, go. Okay, there's pre-production, you get that funding. Then you've got to submit a report. When they're happy and they see that you've done it and whatever, they release the production money. Okay, then they see something, then they release the post-production money. Okay, then they release the last bit. Okay, so it's giving you that understanding in terms of how the, f how the, uh, the whole production um, ecosystem works. Okay, or how the whole producing a film works. Okay, so we started that program in 2017. Our first winners made their films in 2018. So many of those films have gone on to win awards here locally. They've gone on to win international awards. They have been broadcast to over 150 festivals across the world. Um, they are winning in really big. Jackson Wilde is considered the Green Oscars. Okay, this year, two of our films had special jury mention. Two of the films that three of the films that you'll watch. Four of them actually. One was the year before. Four of the films that you'll watch today had special jury mention in a massive, massive world event like Jackson Wild. when it comes to this particular industry. It shows that our stories are important and that the juries find our stories fascinating and they find that, no, listen, we want to do stuff with them, okay? And so today, um, you're going to see across... Like I said, we've got over 20 films. I think we've got five or six short films that we're going to show now. Okay. Um, and then after that, we'll do um, a bit of Q&A. Uh, and you can ask as many questions, etc., that you like. And then after that, we're going to go, I believe we're going to go off to the pool area where we'd like to invite you for some drinks and some snacks. Uh, and you can ask as many questions as you like uh, from there, you know, over there as well. Although I did say I came with some weapons. So earlier on, you were asking um, a question about content creators, right? And Sejo De answered really well. So I think before we start the films, I think I'm just gonna give Sejo uh, uh, a hoodie, you know. Oops, there you go. Cool. Uh, there's a lot there, guys. Uh, Pragna and Toby are not going to allow me to go back with them. So please ask as many questions as you like afterwards. Yes. 
Yeah, I just wanted to, 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 to find out from you as a person who's actually shooting films from wildlife and, and you know, environment. As a, as a filmmaker, I think I'm a filmmaker. Uh, we have African stories that we'd like to shoot. You know, it's like magical films, uh, sci-fis, if we, we may call it that way, that we, we, we need to involve you know, animals on it. Like, you know, uh, uh, what can I call it? Semi-witchcraft films that uses also animals. Uh, is it possible that maybe if we've got that kind of a script that we can come over to you, then you identify the real, you know, uh, area or environment that we can use to shoot those kind of films when we tell you whether we need an elef elephant that we can use a baboon or something like that. that at the end of the day is not going to bring any harm to us because uh you know w when i look at other films like abatur it's it's uh they created it uh, you know through editing or something but now, if we want to come live, to bring the story live, use the real, you know, animals, not trying to edit them to look like real animals, but through editing. If we want to use those kind of things, is it possible that you can help us with that? So absolutely. I mean, there's a couple of things to answer in that in that question. Is one. Um, yes, it is, as an idea, it is absolutely important. With these, with this genre or with wildlife and with animals and whatever, it doesn't mean you've got to only come and do a nature and wildlife film, okay? You can have, you can do a soapy. Set the soapy in a game reserve, you know? Um, yes, animals are steeped in... Um, the use of our traditional practices. So yes, include them. You know, the advice that I can give you and the thing that we can help with, okay, is we can connect you with the experts and scientists that could give you the best kind of advice in terms of when working with animals, this is how to do it, number one. Number two, the way I know that very often a lot of the industry does, because like I was saying, the animals don't read the script is very often they will use uh, rehab centers and sanctuaries where an elephant was rescued, let's say, from a circus. The elephant is fairly tame, and you apply to them to, can I include the elephant in the film? But it's fairly tame, uh, and invariably you're, you're not going to injure yourself. And they would have a handler or somebody that's there controlling how it's done. Obviously, there's a set of protocols involved in terms of how you've got to treat the animal, what you've got to do, that kind of stuff. But yes, there is that available. Okay? Cool. Um, all right. Tobes, will you? So there's about five films. they all about... Six films. So it's about the next hour that will be watching and then we'll just do a Q&A again after that, okay? The African wild dog is listed as an endangered species on the IUCN Red List. It's the most endangered carnivore in South Africa. A large part of the problem is the history and the perceptions that wild dogs carry. There's only 550 wild dogs left in the whole country. They live in 
family groups that are collaborating their hunting strategy. They help each other. They protect each other. There's this level of social structure and energy that really builds a pack and keeps the cohesion within them. The more time you start spending with them, you start learning the different personalities within the pack, the different roles and responsibilities that the pack members share. That kind of emotional intelligence is something that really draws me to them. The wild dog are the great hunters and they have a nice collaboration when they're doing their hunt. You get a particular individual that is right by the prey and when that particular individual tires out, he pulls off to the edge of the line and the others come in so that they keep that persistent pace. And then the young stars also help the pack to hunt and help to feed the puppies during the training season. Whatever they've killed, they would eat something, swallow it, they would run kilometers back to the den and regurgitate for the puppies. I think it's a very unique system, especially in the African bush where they've got a million other challenges, but they'll put their pack members first. There's so many different threats and a, and a real history of persecution to the African wild dogs. They were seen as vermin. People were receiving financial rewards for killing wild dogs in South Africa. Wild dog territory was completely reduced right across the country. So it kind of shows the kind of urgency we have to conserve the species. The main problem would be human beings. Uh, the snares are being put in a place that you can't really get to patrol every day. And even outside the park then it's like 15 to 20 snares in a kilometer radius or whatsoever. The animal is just running through without anticipating anything and all of a sudden this thing catches it. You actually most likely to lose the entire pack if they go through a snared area. We've had cases where a wild dog's been snared and it's been removed from the pack and placed in captivity for rehabilitation. And often that wild dog does quite fine with getting rehabbed and then suddenly takes a turn for the worst a few days later. And in post-mortems we found that the severity of stress being away from the pack and even something that we nicknamed broken heart syndrome are things that wild dogs really do suffer from. And without the pack and without that cohesion, it's, it's a big struggle for them. They've existed this long because they live and die for their pack. Wild dogs disperse to find new territories and to start packs of their own. It's an adaption that ensures genetic variability. But the problem with this is that they are adapted to traveling very far distances. This causes breakouts out of the park. A dog running 20 kilometers in a space of two hours, getting to understand how far they could actually extend in search for partners. They so often pass through communities, commercial farmlands and highways, and in doing that they land up often becoming roadkill too. And if they encounter communities, they kind of find a way of actually avoiding it. Should we just be saying, let's open up passages for them to actually move through so that they can be able to find a chance to live in some other places or if they do find a suitable land, then they would settle there. The two main objectives that we have within conserving wild dogs in South Africa and in Southern Africa, in fact, number one, maintain what we have and number two, restore what we've lost. That in itself even includes the genetic translocations between the reserves. Simply putting wild dogs in one reserve and, and thinking we've done our job is not the case. Once those pups are born within that pack and they start wanting to breed, we have to ensure that they're breeding with wild dogs that are far related from them. We want to increase the population numbers, which includes the pack numbers and the individual numbers, and also increase the genetic diversity within the wild dogs. The more dogs fitted with tracking collars, the better for the wild dog population of South Africa. Collars need to be under a certain weight in order to be fitted onto a wild dog. 
programmed to log four points a day. This gives us consistent data throughout the time of the collar being on the animal. Information on habitat utilization, population demographics, poaching and snaring incidents, as well as potential breakouts out of the park. We can then use that database within the country to pair up the best dogs and ensure that the best genetics are coming through and increasing that genetic diversity. Educating from grassroots level, from the kids up and getting them to know about wild dogs and grow a love and a passion for wild dogs. Educational in a way, the community starts learning, hey, these animals aren't as dangerous as we thought they were. So just the fact that a, a wild dog has the ability to choose a den and then ensure that the sick, the injured and the young are fed first and looked after and that the fittest dogs will eat at the end, for me says everything we need to know about wild dogs and in fact it's something that I think as humans we almost need to take a page out of their book. Dead pack formation teaches you something and you hope you would see families live like that. You would hope you would see communities coming together. And surely as we are putting efforts into conserving the species, if we get community buy-ins and local farmers buying in, it would actually be formalizing a greater pack system that we've actually observed from these creatures. And in that extent, we would be having at least a combined society towards conservation. When you change the mindset and the perceptions, then you get to a point of saying, hey, I've done something. We've got hope. once told me that our happiness comes from the respect we pay to the land we walk on, the animals we coexist with, and the God we owe it all to. My name is Jamila Jannah, and I was born in the Eastern Cape. It's my first time at this marine protected area and I'm both nervous and excited about this journey. This MPA is the narrowest in South Africa and is a sanctuary for large mammals such as bottlenose dolphins and humpback whales. Its coral reefs are teeming with life. It's indigenous forests with diverse ecosystems and rocky shores that are captivating for scientists. Oyster, mussel, and fish species, which the MPA protects, are also the neighboring community's food and livelihood. The 
proclamation of a more representative network of MPAs in our waters is a great passion of mine. But my biggest interest is to find out more about the coastal communities that live adjacent to the Tlulega MPA. Sabe <laughs> It's in there reserve. As I learn more about the history of marine protected areas, I am conflicted, advocating for a conservation system that brought great hurt to the adjacent community just felt wrong. To ease this brewing conflict, I approached the Oceanographic Research Institute, who are leaders in marine research. I spoke to Dr. Bruce Mann, who studies influence monitoring and management of land fisheries and marine protected areas as a fisheries management tool. All our protected areas now get proclaimed under the National Environmental Management Protected Areas Act. The first criteria that we look at is biological criteria. There's a multitude of habitats that's unique to that area. So you've got perhaps estuary, you've got rocky shore, you've got sandy beach. But then we run what's called a costs layer. So we try and look for areas that are far away from high pressure areas of people so that we impact as few people as possible with the proclamation. It's absolutely essential to bring stakeholders into the whole process of trying to look at where we establish MPAs and how we manage them so that we, we benefit people as much as possible. For years, the Tulela community had customary systems of harvesting invertebrates. They believed that the ocean would speak to them through the tides when it was safe to harvest. <laughs> Unfortunately, many of our protected areas are selected in areas where the population living there is some of the poorest communities in the country. They don't have income. So they are forced to harvest marine organisms, whether they are mussels or rock lobsters or oysters or limpets. To try and manage that in the protected areas, we'll take the MPA and we'll zone it into areas that are controlled zones where they're allowed to fish and, and dive, areas that are controlled pelagic zones where they can dive and only catch pelagic fish, but they leave the bottom fish, and areas that are, are deep and offshore that they don't really use are no-take areas that we protect in perpetuity to allow the fish stocks in that area to, to come, come back and recover. 
To dismiss the history of MPAs is to dismiss the solutions to some of these problems. To abandon the stories of those who have experienced these injustices is to silence the voices of change. Because the Eastern Cape is the land of my birth, and as surely as the waves crash against the shore, so does my heart if I think about our people losing love and respect for all of this. But I feel that change is coming and that with a combination of science, indigenous knowledge, and a collaborative approach, the ocean that I so love will be protected for both the creatures who live in it and the people who depend on it. to take the little things for granted. <sighs> yeah, they shot this right now. I shot him six times. Sometimes all I want Sometimes all I want is silence. I live on the Cape Flats. Growing up here was fun. And at times, very challenging. One evening while playing soccer, we heard screaming. And as kids, you don't wait, you run. We ran into my house and suddenly gunmen open fire on us. 14 year olds now diving on the floor to dodge bullets. My friends and I caught one bullet each. It went quiet and I heard my neighbors knocking on the door, screaming. is considered one of the most dangerous places in the world. Yet this is my home, and it is rich with cultural heritage and diversity. There are also a lot of positive things here too, like the spirit of community and oneness, where no one will refuse help to anyone. <laughs> I 
really just wanted to give kids in my neighborhood a reason to be curious and to spark a little bit of hope that they could do it too. I started to search for peace everywhere. And I found it somewhere I'd never thought to look, in the calmness of the ocean. I put on a mask for the first time. I remember how scared I was. Terrified on the surface. Terrified that creepy soundtrack of Jaws started playing in my mind. Once I saw nothing was out to get me, I started noticing the beauty our ocean had. I got very sad thinking, why hasn't anyone brought me to do this before? I live 40 minutes away from the ocean. Why has it taken me 33 years to finally experience this? The more I dived, the more in love I fell. The feeling of being weightless, being able to fly through the great African sea forests, building a connection with creatures that allow you into this space so that you feel as if you became an underwater being yourself. I found a magical world of peace, beauty and life. Now I explore it without a sound on one breath. discovering this new world and knowing only a handful of people knows about it makes it my duty to show it to others. The biggest reason for doing what I do is my three nieces. My one niece Akifa who lives with me has fallen in love with all that I do. I believe that only once we learn about something will we fall in love with it. And only once we love something we would want to protect it with every fiber in our being. I never imagined that I a Muslim guy from the Cape Flats with no university education, once terrified of the ocean, would now be teaching our youth. I hope to learn even more in order to do my best to conserve both humanity and nature. Through me, I want our youth to see that no matter where you come from or what your situation is, with hard work, we can rise above anything.
Bali Township, Eli Benye, Yamalogish, Ala, eighteen, Ebizwang, Greater Eighteen Day, Lama Malogisha Manigana, Connie Ashtang, Connie Bali, Sibus, and Nanga Mawet Lens, Nimfula, E Hamba Corner, La Paratin and Dow. Code, which only just means a man, I cook as I cut a gile, Ian Gulis, who are candy foot of my papus, Ayash and Lashogon, Cocoon is in. Is the wisdom was a big Kuban to Nagube. Environment is someone who is passionate about the environment, who is interested about how the environment works. <laughs> Ekfundeni <laughs> Unezi <laughs> Strongo, <laughs> Apart from the seven below, I just went to go to see my gegele in Pula as well as my couples. We figured we were not going to get a recycling. So, like the last couple of years, the spaces, the builder, the structure, the figures, the colors, the clearing is good. Okay, look at the one to see recycling. She's a fagala. Look at what we see recycling. She's a begala. Excellent. And then, best of all, the local squad is what is now what we see the days. The starter is what we see central waste. And then buy a bag way, and then we get money. I see Zen is into in isolation. On the 12th February, he went lens day. Also, we could learn to engage more with lens. Go back and cool into Bonaga little glazing down. Even though Abantu be talagwa na more with lens, 
Wena wekwele la kui greta itinde ni umuntu agazu kuti agmela kipezu wai. Agazu umuntu kuti agmela la kututu kutu futu umsiza ganja ni wetlendi yon. Kona iska balapo njenge tombi okula kona na zalba kuli seba gwenzilu memulo ukeze umgane umgene iska beni soguba mdala soguba intombi epelele Uma umpulu nga sanze gile ila poko nicholo pukuta usagwa zuke zindawe zengo buso nindawe ezi sento kiki Zantifuzi palege lumusi impula siti ni sanze gile waba guningi wa wama shigo etu njenga bante wa miyamu okala kone mpule Sigi watlendi ya sewi le fontein, epe zuzwa na njina sembali, izlalele afetuwa umutuwe, afetuwa umuzi ya bantu, aguko mkwa kwa iti stepayo, izpilela zase ngevelu. Wetland, ifana na yonti ndawe no msabati. Wata yoni, sige ngugusu msabati wae utande ya kulu, utaga, unamanza maningi. Yiku wazu, uti kwazu kupina amanzi. Ipinde futi, igu wazu, uti wakilini amanzi. Wakipese tanze gile mpule. Kotu wale, numagu nje, nagugu slegu nje. Kotu zanzi, gya peta mwa ukona ama wetlands. Apinda kundezo nubus kona izi ingu, pezu wae, na setu ze wae, na mkwaku, enga mula pagazi. Sigu wetland ea eh, asekreta itindale mall, eparati kwe mbali ni Ashdown. Gyo na le wetland, ya chole tuwa loguti iri hape li tei, tuwa itole mpila wabush. Mwa peni mizi mni ngela, ikatiwi ni ingadi, ibi iwe ii nish. Koto mautu ya pega nga pesha kwa mkago Ngoba ya segu inda o ya humeni no maa maspala Utolu kutigi ya lashwa Agioni nito enagiwe futi omunye no omunye Gia pikso anuguti wena mangi lasha la unge na api ngoba inda agio nda o yako Inda waga maspala Kutima segu wa pela lo babu ntu Buguti babamsa na bantu besi bekata Inda o nimpi ilo ya abo njingu mpagati babamsen my challenge and call it ten in it, my spouse to sit on him sedans, the system on him sedans. Mom, I said to work, Tabang, and you're with okay, what can I do with this, whatever that I have around me? No, man, I was a woman, but a child. The Ukok and the woman and the Massamagans, the boy, the man, but a child, son to put him with the Siba, I might barrage him because in the day it's in the same Nagavilla as I might barrage him. The only is Nagavilla, son to Saban, the student environment. Your near was a pain and a pain was got at him as well. The pain of a pain of a pain. No, you see, put Mula, a man, the swap is the same thing now. See, so that young, who led to a senior city. Who could ever wait to have my inheritance to the name of food? Go by, no seven is one time. I go and I endorse all the young and unchanged next to your science. We endorse a medicine pain, be lifestyle. I'm 
Thank you. So that's just a, a sample of films that were produced by all of them first time filmmakers. In actual fact, of all the films that you saw, not one of them had ever been to film school. Not one of those filmmakers had ever been to film school. Uh, two of them are scientists and one of them is a conserv uh, conservation group. Okay, um, and so as Africans, we are natural storytellers, guys. Okay, we all, you know, give fire, and then we'll start saying something. Okay, so the the message here is that you don't you don't have to be you don't have to have gone to film school to do this. You don't have to have gone to film school to have the history and the knowledge and the passion for this kind of stuff. And if you look at some of the films, the last one that was shown now is a scientist who's a marine biologist. She came to our first New Congress and presented the work that she was doing 
as a scientist to um, to the to the to the new audience, um, and and was saying one of the things she was saying was that she felt very guilty as a young black female scientist from the Eastern Cape coming to women in KwaZulu Natal who have been have got so much indigenous knowledge who have been collecting these muscles for so many years and coming to tell them how they should handle and how they should protect um, their 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 stuff. But if you look at her film, and she was a first-time filmmaker, I really enjoyed the process in terms of watching her uh, um, do this film. One of the things she was really clear about all the time to the, di to the cinematographer um, slash director of the film was that she wanted to portray these women in a really powerful and strong way. And I think, guys, you guys have got to remember is so often the narrative in uh, these films, especially when it comes to human wildlife conflict, especially when it comes to communities living around us, okay, is that um, they are the problem, okay, or that we are just using the resources, okay. The way she portrayed the woman in this film, you can see they are powerful, they are strong, they practice conservation in, the, in their harvesting. You know, they teach, they, sh they, they passing the knowledge on to a younger generation, okay? And even though they might be poor from a financial perspective, they live in so much rich natural habitat. And that's where they see and get their value from. And those are the kind of narrow um, in, our, in our storytelling. We can change, <coughs> excuse me, we can change the way we portray ourselves in the films. We can change the way we portray our people in the films, okay? The, the other film, Shulega, um, in the Eastern Cape, it's a young woman who is passionate about marine protected areas, okay? But she's also going and listening, giving the community a voice, getting their side of it, okay? For so often, we just tell the stories from the side of the animal or from the side of the authorities, but giving the communities a voice. If you, if you watch the film about um, uh, the EnviroChamps in Peter Marisburg, um, uh, in Mbali Township, for me, I... I went to an event in 2017, which was World Wetlands Day, and I saw this group of young black guys walking around t-shirts, taking kids on a tour, and in Zulu, g explaining and telling them how the wetlands work, etc. And I was like, f I was completely fascinated, as in, wow, you know, this is who we have. And these are all kids that had gone to university, that had studied environmental science, that had studied conservation, you know, and there they were doing this work. And I challenged them that, yeah, that time I said to them, why don't you come and pitch your story at our Congress to, to make a film about it? They did. That film, the guy, uh, Mlu, Mlu uh, Nduli, that speaks in the beginning, he's not a filmmaker. His first words to me, but I'm not a filmmaker. I'm like, that's fine. You, if your story wins, we will connect you with filmmakers who will be passionate enough, as long as you drive it and you guys you know, work out how you want to be told in that particular story, okay? They made that film. The following year at our Congress, one of the heads of the biggest conservation organizations in South Africa was there. They broadcast that film. He, they won 50,000 rand to make that film, right? At our Congress the following year, they played that film. The head of the conservation organization was there. He was completely blown away in terms of the work that they do and what they do, right? That. He called him aside after the, for after the screening and said to him, for one year, he will, give him, he will give him funding to employ 75 young people in the Peter Marisburg area to clean the rivers in that particular area. That one film translated to 2.75 million rands worth of salaries in one year. And that's the power that you guys have as filmmakers. That's the power that we have as storytellers, okay? We c one film can change so many lives. One film can change so many perspectives, can give hope, 
can, and I think, I think it is um, this past week, we've been, a lot of our films have been showing on, um, and films from friends of ours from across the world has been showing on people's weather because it's been COP26, uh, the climate change conference that's been taking place in Glasgow in, in, in the UK. Um, and whether we like it or not, climate change is real. Okay, and we are being, the sad part is, we as Africans have got the least uh, carbon footprint. We have, create, we have caused the least damage, yet we are going to be impacted the most by climate change. Okay, and it's sad and it's unfair, and there will be, again, that's another topic of environmental justice stories and of, activism, of environmental activism that you guys can tell. And so, to close off, uh, and before there's any questions, I think what we want to do and say is, we're really excited and appreciative that Kia invited us to come and, 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 and be a part of this and, sh and, sh and share the work that we do. We are not, we would love to come back next year. We would be saying to Kia, we will be available to come and do any workshops, um, you know, whether it's online, whether it's in person, you know, let us know, uh, follow us on our page. Let us know, we, we want to come and reach out to organizations like, like the Rustenberg Film Festival, because we're saying, nature is everywhere, okay? And we wanna come to, you know, and create opportunities at these festivals for people living in these areas, because we can't all say, come to our Congress, or you can, or we can only do it if you come to NUF. You know, no, we need to grow the industry as a whole. And that's why it's important for us to come and, and outreach and come and be and partner everywhere across the country. And so we'd like to say that we, we, there, yes, there are opportunities at our Congress. And yes, we'd like you to come and visit. But we'd also like to come back and we'd also like to create opportunities here in your own province and, and partner and, and do whatever we can to help. So uh, are there any questions? Okay, before the questions, I have a jacket that I want to give uh, that guy with the orange jack, uh, cap there. He was dancing so nicely when the music started playing. So, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, we have uh, eight people that okay. want to ask questions. So, I know, I know to all of them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, okay, no, thank you for the opportunity. So first and foremost, I'd just like to say the, what you guys are doing is, is incredible, right? So with what you just said now, that you would like to come to Northwest, to you know, Rustenburg, and actually help the, the, the film industry you know, to get into nature conservation and all that. But with that, um, from my little understanding of the film that is the filmmaking in Rustenburg, right? Not a lot of the people who are in the film industry are, are necessarily qualified or are well clued up when it comes to nature conservation and um, wildlife. So my thing is, with, the, with what you're saying, um, are you guys willing to get or introduce programs that would um, empower young people in Northwest into getting into the nature conservation um, film industry? So to answer that very quickly, yes, most definitely. But we'd like to do it through the Rustenberg Film Festival, not to come and do it as, our, as ourselves, you know, so that it's coordinated locally, that it's supported locally. But I also need to say, and uh, uh, Potchefstroom uh, Northwest University, it is Poch, right? It is one of the most powerful organizations and institutions in the country when it comes to conservation and conservation research, okay? There are a number of brilliant scientists, black African scientists who are there. And I'd like to encourage you guys to reach out to them. Find out who they are. Go and look and see, you know, uh, because it's important that we reach out to, to these guys that are working in, in, in conservation. And, and um, believe me, there are lots of them right here. Okay. 
Okay, guys, let's try to put the microphone close to your mouth so you can be here live. Okay. Hello. Thank you very much for your presentation. It's uh, highly enlightening and encouraging. Um, my name is Prince from Botswana. Yes, um, Botswana is a country that is very rich in wildlife. Um, but again, like the story, the sad story that you just narrated, um, they end black um, people practicing or producing wildlife films in a country as um, richly endowed as um, Botswana. Um, there's a lot of films in National Geographic that comes elsewhere. Now, the, the question that I have um, to you is, what um, uh, my interest it's in the new f uh, development fund uh, because as we all know film production it's it's highly capital intensive. Um, are you open to Africa in terms of your um, s uh, film labs or is it a South African thing? And and if 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 not. Uh, do you have any intentions of uh, spreading your wings and coming across? Because um, if you do, we'll be waiting for you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm very proud to tell you that we have had, uh, and I wish we, we should have actually played a film. <laughs> um, but we have had a new pitch winner from uh, Botswana. We have had, uh, at Congress, we have a competition called um, Newf eh? yeah, the Newf Narrator Live, where we look for African voices to narrate in uh, nature and wildlife films. Okay, and one of our, our winner in 2020 was from Botswana. Okay, we had two finalists from Botswana. Um, so in Botswana in particular, yes, there has been, and yes, we, will, we reach out across Africa. We just did, uh, we called it a Compose Yourself. We just did a Compose Yourself lab last week, not last week, was it last week? Week before. And we had five composers from around Africa, Morocco, Kenya, Mozambique, Nigeria, and South Africa. So it's not South Africa focused. It's all across Africa. We try and, you know, Africa is a continent. It's not a country. And it's a message I also want to say, yeah, is South Africa has got most of the resources in terms of film and whatever. It does not mean we, and as we grow in this industry and as we get better in this industry, does not mean that we must go and tell the rest of Africa's stories. We need to go and partner we need to, Africa is a continent, not a country. And very often people will say, I'm using local crews, but it's South Africans working in Botswana. That's not local crews. Local crews are Botswana people working in Botswana. Okay, or a partnership, you know, a partnership between them. Okay, and, and so it's something that I would like, I hope you guys remember that in terms of when we, when we work across the continent, we have to respect, you know, and, and support each other that way, okay? Because then we're never gonna grow the industry across the continent. Um, but yes, we would, we would be happy to come and be involved. Uh, to Tuesday, we're starting a dive lab in Tanzania. And we are partnering with an organization, who uh, a conservation organization, to do the lab. So yes, we look for partners everywhere. We do not uh, want to create news all over the continent. No, we're looking for partners all the time to say how can we how can we collaborate, how can we help each other, you know, to to grow the industry. That's our need. That's what we want. We want to grow an army of natural history, environmental and wildlife filmmakers across Africa. That's the only thanks we need. We don't need any money from it. We don't need anything back, you know. And we will help raise the funding 
to help grow your, you know, your organization skills as well as ours and build this network. Because as we build this network, we will become stronger and more powerful and we can tell, continue to tell our own stories. That's the most important. Uh, thank you very much, uh, my brother. I've got uh, a few questions, actually. Yes. Uh, and these questions are primarily based on the first film. The reason I'm saying that is that I noted them while we were watching the first film. Okay. I stopped after on all those others, even though I've watched it. There's a specific reason for that. It's because my interest... I've got nothing against the, the other films, how they are made, conservation issues, environment, no issues there. My interest is on nature telling its own stories. You see the wild dogs, they become your characters, you track them down, you create a story, a narrative out of that. That's where my interest is and all these questions are based within that, that context. But Firstly, I want to ask, why do we get one film that tells a story of nature telling its own story? And the majority of those that were screened are more documentary people, from the people and environment. Yeah. So that's my, my first question, basically. Okay. And, and, and really, my interest also is that uh, I want you to share your experience on the question. You'll see how my questions are, basically. I want your, your experience in it. Uh, one is that, uh, you know, when we create health-based dramas, the kind of fights that goes into production with doctors, professors of health, and all of that, and then ultimately, doctors hate watching health dramas because of the creative licenses that we take as creatives. So my question is that, does that apply with uh, and uh, wildlife uh, narratives where those specialists that you were talking about, uh, uh, I don't even know what they are called, but uh, people who specialize, for example, in, in lion behavior and stuff like that, uh, do, do, have you experienced a situation where they will disagree with you that that's not how you can uh, portray a, a lion in this environment or whatever animal? And as a creative, you feel that this tells a good story if it's tell in the manner in which it does. Mm -hmm. you, you get my, well, just, just your, your experience on that. And then secondly is that, you know, uh, I'm sorry to say that to, the, to language purists. I always find English very limiting when it comes to telling our own story, especially within this context. So I just want you to share us your experience with regards to the use of indigenous languages to narrate our stories. Obviously, we've got uh, sub uh, subtitles and all of that that we can use for English, but the core of the story, what has been the experience, particularly given the, the market out there where we are telling our story, whether it's Kosa, Sisul, whatever, but uh, we put sub subtitles, how is the market reacting uh, to that? Uh, the third one is, uh, this one really has got to do with the timelines and budgets. Uh, we would know within the context of the wildlife, the stories that I would want. Should I, should I go through? It's only five, though. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, let me answer uh, the first three. Okay, right. Let me answer the first three, and then, and then we can get to the other two before I forget. Okay? So the first, film, the first question you asked was, that was a wildlife film tell on the wildlife telling its own story. So... That film that we showed was kind of what we call a natural history film, where you observe, there's a lot of footage where you're observing the animals, and you're explaining the behavior of the animals. And it's less, and then you have experts talking about it as well, correct? As compared to uh, the other films that were documentaries about people living next to parks or people having issues, you, you, you know? So, we have, out of the 20 films, we have about four only that are animal-focused, animal-driven. Five, five, there's a fifth one being made this year, okay? Reason for that is purely and simple budget. 
natural history films are one of the most expensive documentary type of films to make ever. For the first and foremost reason, the animals don't read the script. And so, where you want to get an animal doing X, Y, Z, you know, with an actor you can say, I want you to walk from here to there, turn around, kiss that guy, and walk out the door. You can't tell that to the dog. Okay, the dog decides he's running there. And if your camera's not there, you'll have to wait till the dog runs this way to get that shot. Okay, that could mean two days or four days. Okay, we just come off a controlled elephant relocation shoot where the plan was, was uh, we were going to uh, relocate them 10th to the 14th of October. I left home on the 9th, I came home on the 21st because the elephants didn't read the script. Okay, we were shooting with a camera that costs 14,000 rand a day to hire, just the body, no lenses, okay? We had to sit and scratch our heads. Do we send it back or do we stay? Of course, we need the shot, okay? And we stayed, but that's seven days of you know, I'm using one line item and telling you what's the cost. Okay, so these films are all made with only 50,000 Rand. That's their budget. That's what they win. And they can't go raise more money. They can get people to do stuff for free, but they can't go raise more money. Okay, so that's the main reason why, you can, why it's very hard. Okay, but yes, we need to tell them. Yes, if you look at the weather shot that I, that I told, she wrote a story about the turtles and their behavior, but it's footage that was already there. So that's a way of starting already. There are lots of places where there's archive footage that you can narrate a story on, you know, if you have access to that, story, to that content. Second question was... Um, Uh, limitations that we have with specialists vis-a-vis -vis creative licenses. Okay, so very first and foremost, the genre most of the time falls in factual. And factual means your facts need to be correct. You can't make up stuff. So your, your creative license is fairly limited. You know, I can't say that the elephant has three babies a year when that's not possible. Okay? because I want to now choose up my, my story, okay? And if you're using experts, you've got to, they will give you the advice. You can't, if they say to you, whales only come between June and November, you say, hey, but no man, I want to encourage these people to come in May. I'm gonna say that the whales start arriving in May. It's only one month early. It's, it's wrong. Factually, it's wrong, and there will be people who call you out. They are, like at the SABC for, with 50-50. So all these films have played on 50-50 as part of an agreement that we made with the SABC factual, factual division. And they licensed these films. But there were very, uh, very often there were times where there was a call back from 50-50 saying, are you sure this fact is correct that you've said, yeah? And then we have to go and produce it or get a clip or get something from the the expert saying that no, it is indeed correct. And so you've got a scientist or somebody backing up the claims that you've made. It's extremely important in factual. If it was being used in a drama, if it was a soapy set in a game reserve, then you can play around with some of the things, okay? But not, you can't stretch the, the truth too far. So very often the experts that are in there are happy and they approve very often what is being said. If they don't, if, if you stretch the truth, they will call you out. And nowadays, they don't need to go to the newspapers or the television. They just go to social media and start, you know, 
pointing out that what you did is wrong or what you're saying is incorrect, you know? The way you, you, you have answered, I'm only left with one question. Okay. I was going to ask you about issues of budgets and timelines because yes, yes, of yes. seasonal issues and all of that. But uh, uh, this one is more on the creative side, really, to say that uh, these stories, you, you call them uh, 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 historical natural history. Uh, natural history. Yes. yes. Are they created at the, at, the, at the research stage, which means at pre-production, which means it's an outcome of a research. You would go and research whatever, get the information that you need and lay out your own story. Or are they created at post-production, at editing? Or is it just a, a mixture of both in your, in your, in your experience? So the natural history ones, mostly, the, 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 the largest shape of the story takes place in post-production. Because they go, so they, let's say they become aware of a particular behavior or something really special or a special research or study that is taking place about these particular animals. And they, so they hear about it. Then they go and gather, they document the activity or the animal or the, or the behavior. And then they come back, and then now they start writing to make it, you know, engaging and exciting. And, you know, so they might shoot things. The, the way it gets crafted in the end might not be the way it gets shot. They might have arrived there and the baby elephant was born, but they only included at the end of the film. And they turned the whole film in the beginning about this arduous journey of how this elephant struggled and, you know, and, and it like was touch and go and that the baby was not going to be born and, and then the baby's born right at the end. Do, do you know what I'm saying? That it's, so you, most of it is crafted. You get a script very often with the NFVF when you're applying for this kind of things, and especially with documentary. They'll ask for a script path, not an in-depth script because it's documentary. You don't know what you're going to get nine out of 10 times. You can plot and plan of what you want to get. You know you're going to shoot the rains come from this month to that month. The water fills up from this month to that month. The turtles come out here, or the lions come here, or the elephants migrate at this time to this time. You know, So you can plot all of that. And the history has shown that they cross at this particular point, or they reach this age, you know, at this time, and that's when the bulls start fighting. So you can plan all of that, and you can put that in your script part. But the real meat or the real story is written afterwards. Okay. Good. Hi. Thanks. Two. Um, I just wanted to find out, um, I'm actually interested in the SABC1 and SABC3 journey um, and how it ended. Um, I see you mentioned licensing with the 50-50. Um, and also just to know, do you send out calls um, for people to submit for these kind of short films? I've seen that most of them are about eight minutes. And also if you've considered partnering with a broadcaster to say that, you know, because that that way it becomes easier when, you know, it's a call to action of some sort in terms of airtime because then you can have your ads, um, you know, and people can start knowing because it's my first time knowing about this, you know, and I was watching, um, I think it's Shamia, and um, I thought of Deep Blue Sea. And if you think of Deep Blue Sea, which was filmed in 99, more than 20 years ago, and recently they've brought it back. Yes. So it's those little things that tells you that, um, you know, there's clearly a gap in terms of the f those kind of stories because then it means nothing else was ever done post mm -hmm. that, that which, you know, would hook people. Um, because I believe that with proper funding, it is possible to try and, and tell a story um, that can even be more lengthy, right? And we base it on a true, tr based on true events. Yes, yes. Kind of vibe. Yeah, and, and so just to answer your question about the call out, is yes, every year we do send out, we send out a call out, inviting people, uh, inviting uh, storytellers to pitch their idea to come and pitch the ideas at a in front of a live audience to win 50,000 Rand to make your short film. So that's the new pitch fellowship uh, that takes place at our Congress every year. We're changing that model slightly, but 
it's still a call out that will go out and it's it's open across the the continent not just south africa okay um that's that's the one thing the other thing is yes we did we had an agreement with the sabc with 50 50 um through through 50 50 where they had they assisted us in terms of saying we will take these films and make it part of 50 50. And that's why they, some of them have been 12 minutes or 8 minutes or cut down because they've got to fit into a segment of 50 50. Okay? But the most important thing is they were, these filmmakers were paid for their films. It was licensed from them, not licensed from NUF. The only thing we, agreement we have with the filmmakers is that we can use these films for free promotion to promote and to create awareness we will not put it on any platform where we get paid as new they will get paid for it if it's a paying platform not us what we do is it's about building an industry and developing an audience we trying to build, develop an audience so that you know eventually the more films we make like this and the more time the more we see ourselves in conservation the more we produce this kind of content sabc1 is going to send out call outs saying we're looking for this kind of content with black female scientists black male scientists made by black people you know at the moment there's been no in their minds there's no audience okay so we're creating the push in terms of saying no you've got to call for out for this for this content because it's interesting because it's important because you know when we when we released code green back in 2015 we were playing directly opposite 5050 we were playing against WWF we were on SABC1 but we had an average for the 13 part series we had an average of 975,000 viewers per Sunday it was on a Sunday at half past 5 okay we were up against all of that but we were just under a million viewers every single week it showed that people were interested okay it showed that they that there was a need for this okay and there was families that were interested and so yes we will if you have an idea if there's um the the nvf um bef you know one of our biggest supporters and funders um has been the nvf and uh, kwazulu natal film commission and National Geographic Society, okay? The NFVF have, you know, have supported us over the last four years because they want to grow this genre in, 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 in the country. And they are looking for applications in this genre. You know, they're looking for ideas. And what we, what we are saying is if you have an idea, if you want to apply to the NFVF, if there's a call out, you know, make contact. We will try and help you if wherever we can to make sure your application is as strong as it possibly can be. Because we want to see that this industry is growing. We want to get as many black African filmmakers into this industry as possible. You know, we drive a very strong transformation agenda. We're not ashamed of it. We don't call it out. We don't apologize for it. Okay? We, but we, we try our best not to exclude everybody. But our, our, our mission is that the stories of Africa are told and, and its wonders are told and led by indigenous African people. And the word led doesn't say that it's exclusively. Okay? It's told, led by, organically led by indigenous African people. Okay, and that's what we need to do if we're going to turn around the challenges that we face, you know, as a, as, a, as, a, as a planet. Okay, so yes, there is opportunity. Please reach out. Um, and we are constantly talking to broadcasters, constantly. That's why we have this partnership with People's Weather, where uh, we're not getting the, they're not getting paid for, for the films on People's Weather, but at least it's a platform where you can go to funders, you can say, my film, my, we are getting the work out there. That's one of the things that funders want to see most of the time is, do you have a distribution platform? Is there somewhere where those films are going to be shown? Okay, it's no use just giving funding to make a film and then you're showing it to the kids at home. 
and the family and it's you know it's in, it's must get out there to the people okay yes uh thank oh. you where are we there um, yeah yeah Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I want to talk about gatekeeping, ne? and then by by starting by saying, for instance, I emphasize what you said when you said uh, Northwest University is one of the best institutions when it comes to wildlife, environment, and nature. And part, why I'm saying this is because Pilanisbeck National Park was researched by Northwest University, Poch University, or as should I say, Poch Campus, in 1969. And then when you read historically, they don't put Mr. Mangope as the person who gave them that permission or as the person who commissioned them to do that. Uh, it's only poch people, Professor whom and Professor. So like the movies that you played, you started with a white uh, documentary. Yeah. And then you can distinguish between the white documentaries and the, I'm sorry to say, we black uh, documentaries. So the problem or the challenge that we have is that we stay next to the parks, we ourselves. And sometimes when you get into the parks, you have people inside the parks, white people, who even put stickers on their cars. They say they are park officials or park wardens. <laughs> and then they harass us inside the parks because they think they own the parks. And they think nature an environment, it's their space, it's not for black people, you see. And that's why I have a problem because I'm going to give you examples. Ne? Johnny Bravo, the festival uh, director, uh, we went with him in Pilanesberg to shoot, a, I think it was a heritage related uh, documentary. He went through there's a, a granny in Murulen called Grace Masuku. She's an indigenous knowledge holder. So it was easy for us to get inside. If I'm like Mr. Malau, Oscar Tsabobuane, we went through, because it's very tough to get inside the park. The people who are working in the park, the, the black guys, are gatekeepers. They will ask you many things, but when it's time for white people to get inside, they don't, they don't struggle to get inside. So basically, I want to know, how do you advise us? Because, like for instance, the, the, the second last movie, uh, documentary, you saw there was a white guy who said, why are you poaching the muscles? I'm going to make sure the police arrest you, you see? So it's the situation that we experience. Lastly, we were making a COVID uh, music video last year, April. Luckily, I had a permit. We went to Bakubung Gate, which is part of Pilanesberg. Yeah. When we were shooting there, there was a white guy inside. He said, what we were doing there? Why are we shooting? Then I asked him, where do you come from? I even told him straight on the face that you are coming from Europe. You, ca <laughs> you cannot tell us where we should shoot. This is our land, you see, because our heart fall. Uh, he called the station commissioner to us, and then we waited, you see. And then you realize that this guy is a shareholder in Legacy. He's a manager at Bakubung Lodge. And then you can see that the commissioner often go to the restaurant, they give him food and what what. So from the, from the whatever that conversation that I was having with the station commerce, you can feel that he was in the pockets of the guy. So we are having a serious problem to access our own uh, spaces because white people have uh, privatized the space for us. So I want to know how do we juggle around if you want to get into that uh, space. Thanks. Okay. Um, yeah, there are many currents around the world <laughs> um, who, who just assume and believe that those spaces are their own and, and if we come there. And I mentioned it 
when we were doing our TV series back in 2015, where one of our biggest challenges was access to wildlife, because they were like, who are these people? Why, wh since when are black people filming wildlife? Why, what are they doing here? So with that in mind, and we've done it in KwaZulu-Natal, we have started um, reaching out to Northwest Parks, we, have re we are reaching out to sand parks. We are reaching, we have uh, uh, talking to uh, the National Department of Forestries and Fisheries to say, uh, in KwaZulu-Natal, we've started the process in terms of saying, guys, we have young emerging filmmakers that are coming out. We need to provide access for them. One of their biggest challenges is access. So what we very often, what we do, with the films that they shoot, we assist them in terms of applying for permits. Uh, with Isimangaliso Wetland Park in KwaZulu-Natal, we have a partnership with them. That's why we are broadcasting the, the weather from the park in order to uh, showcase the park and create, um, an, in exchange for them, assisting us in providing access for young emerging filmmakers. And when I say young, I'm putting that young in inverted commas because it could be, young could be just in terms of experience in that genre. Doesn't necessarily have to be only your age, okay? So, yes, we are working with the authorities. Yes, I understand the challenges that you went through because I went through them myself. And there are many times where we still go through them. For example, there is a particular park where we just recently, where we went, we have a permit to use a drone, okay? I've seen when tourists use the drone, there's no question. Our guys put the drone up, the security are there five minutes later. <laughs> Not even five minutes, you know? Yet we have a piece of paper that proves, okay? And it is, it's a reality, we are working on it. I wish I could say to you, it's gonna go away tomorrow. No, it isn't. But it's a reality that we are working on and we are trying to fix. Um, but, you know, wherever we can help, we will, as an organization, we will help. We will lend our voice. We will lobby our friends around the world and the rest of South Africa to assist. Um, because it's going to be twofold. It's going to be the national parks and it's going to be private parks that you've got to negotiate and, 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 and ask for access. And that's why it's so hard for us to get ahead and to produce this kind of content because it's so hard to get in. Access is still our biggest, biggest challenge, okay? And that's why we, 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 we're trying to do whatever we can to create that access, to create the opportunities for you to get in and tell the stories that you want to tell. So yes, it's, it's a journey. It's not, it's not a thing that's completed, but we are working on it. Um, thank you, Mr. Nu, for the presentation and for giving us hope. Uh, mine is a small one. As a producer, I would like to know, um, are there places where we can plug this kind of information or this kind of films? Because uh, when you produce something, you need to know where are you distributing it. And how are you going to help young person who have seen these films today and they already have a story because where I'm sitting and where I come from I see so many stories so how do you help such a person okay um, again from our website you can access uh, information or send qu questions in terms of saying I I'm looking for this kind of information, I'm looking for this kind of help, we could connect you with, if we can't answer it, we can connect you with somebody. Uh, some advice that I can give here now in terms of if you produce a film, okay? The landscape has changed so considerably now. Um, you don't have to wait to have a deal from the SABC to start distributing your content, okay? Social media is a powerful platform. But another platform is um, a thing called Film Freeway. All right, so Film Freeway is a platform that filmmakers around the world, no matter what genre, 
whether it's fiction, whether it's factual, use to enter their films into film festivals. All right? The first film that you watched, uh, she has entered a film into over 120 film festivals across the world. Um, the last film that you won, that, that you watched just won uh, Yale University's um, won one of the categories at Yale University. They paid her a license fee to put their film, her film, on their platform at Yale University. Okay, uh, the Rise from the Cape Flats, Cape Flats film um, won the Dr. Sylvia Earle My Hero Award. Dr. Sylvia Earle is like the god of underwater. She's the most celebrated scientist. She's the scientist that took Barack Obama to go and dive uh, in that area that he declared a protected area in the USA, uh, marine protected area. She selected that film as her film that, that won her, her competition that she has every single year, okay? Because of that, other platforms, streaming platforms, started contacting him to say, can we license your film, okay? Just by him, do you understand the, the publicity that it gets? You know, so he didn't wait for the SABC or, or whatever. It's putting it out there. And these are free film. There are a lot of film festivals where you have to pay, okay? But there are hundreds that you can look at that it's free. It just needs data, okay? And it's free to upload. And, and if you, you know, we've got um, Lulega and there's another film we didn't show today called Perfumla both ocean films that are showing, that are touring the um, um, Canada and the USA, okay? Uh, being shown in universities because there's a mobile film festival that does that. Just from them submitting their films. You know, so it's, it's get, you know, that's how you get the exposure. That's how you grow as a, as a filmmaker. So um, that's the encouragement that I can give you. There are other stuff that we're doing in terms of the SABC, in terms of that agreement that we had with uh, Factual. Um, and I say that we had, the reason is because 5050 is no longer being broadcast at the moment. Um, I think it will come back. I mean, it's the longest running television series in South Africa. So I don't know if they'll ever get rid of it. Uh, we hope not. Um, and then there's People's Weather. That is a great platform for us in terms of reaching people across. So yes, there are avenues. And like I say, the thing that I said in the beginning, we'll be more than happy to give advice and assist where we can. Oh, okay. Are we good? Yes. All done? Oh, there's one more. Oh. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh, I heard you talk about uh, partnering with other organizations so that you can expand your services beyond the boundaries of South Africa. Yes. I'm from Kenya and I'm asking you, how do I get your services from my homeland when, once I go back there? So I can, there's two ways. One, we already partner with the most powerful, uh, crazy, mad woman, <laughs> call her mad, I can call her that because she's my friend, uh, Dr. Paula Kahumbu. I know her. In, in, in Kenya. Um, she heads up Wildlife Direct. She's just started uh, or is in the process of working with another organization called African Films for Wildlife. Um, and she's a force of nature. Okay. Uh, we are already partnering with her. But um, it's not an exclusive kind of thing. And we will partner with anybody to try and advance the shared goals that we have with an organization. And, and so it's a, it's a reach out to say, hey guys, I'm doing this. Would you like to be a part of it? And how can you be a part of it, you know? Or something like that. And we would definitely look at it. Okay, thank you very much. Absolutely. Okay. Um, oh. this one. Uh, good day, sir. Uh, so I wanted to ask a question that like I, in your platform, do we have like films where you like not basically 
focusing on wildlife but focusing on wildlife like uh, careers like for other kids who are not basically filmmakers but showing them like there is a broad career where you can be a, maybe following a scientist who deal with animals or marine biology like a, a film showing those people who are like because me i'm from the township you know and there's not a lot of wildlife in the township so like is there any film that you guys have shot or something like that why don't i challenge you to make it yeah i can make it yes <laughs> i've uh, there's we have a whole database of scientists yeah. that are fellows new fellows so why don't you send us a proposal and say this is of what I'd like to do. I'd like to do two-minute profiles or three-minute profiles to encourage. And I want to do it. You can say, listen, I want to do it for the Northwest province. Yes. You know, and I want to do it just so that uh, there's nothing stopping you. You know, and it's something we would definitely look at. It's a great idea in terms of encouraging kids. And that's why it's so important for us to ensure, to, to, to make sure that the we change the narrative by showing kids, you know, it's important that Jamila says, I'm a scientist, that they see, that they know that she is a scientist, you, you know, that they say, oh, a young black woman as a scientist, I can be there too, you know, it's, it's, it's absolutely important. Um, the gentleman at the back said, you know, we started off with the film and you can see it was made, or that's the film that was made by one of the, uh, one of the white the, the white filmmakers. And that young lady came to us when she, and she, she won um, at, at Congress. And she came to us and she said, listen, I have a challenge. My whole crew is white. And the experts that I have about the film are white. But I also understand what y'all's mandate is. Um, she said, because it's a natural history film, it's costing me more than the 50,000. My crew is white because they are friends, they're going to do the work for me. A lot of them are offering their time for free. How can I go about this? So we said, no, it's n no problem. Uh, we can give you, we said it is a problem in that it's against what we are trying to do. We're trying to diversify the industry. We're trying to bring in, you know, it's important. Diversity is critical in terms of what we do. But what we did say is, it's you, who are your experts? And are you telling me that you cannot find a black African expert? And if you look back to the film, the most important voice in the film is Zama, okay? And she changed her story to make him the most important. Um, she, 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 she wrote her story from what she gathered to make him the most important voice in the film. That's one of the ways that we can increase representation in the films. That's one of the ways that we can see that, okay, this is somebody who has serious knowledge about the dogs, not just somebody who's a guy walking around with a gun guarding the dogs, okay? He comes across as if you listen to him in the film, if you see what he's doing, he's a researcher. He's a conservationist, he's a researcher. He went to school. You know, when you, when you talk to Zama and you listen to his story, he says, I lived there, can you see the lights there? Outside the park. And I just wonder, what are those white people doing inside there? Uh, and that's how he got interested. That's how he w went to go and study what he studied, because it was curiosity, you know? And now he's the, he tracks, he researches and he tracks and monitors the dogs and the lions in that park. Okay? He can tell you their behavior. He can tell you, you know, when you listen to him and you listen to the, the things he's saying, you know, you get the picture in your head, you know? And, and he does it so effortlessly. So, yes, great idea. Talk to us. <laughs> I think we'll also give you a jacket for that, eh? Yes. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, I mean, I could have gone away with this question, but I, I hope my question will also help the filmmakers in the house. Um, and first of all, I would like to congratulate Nif. Did I say it right? Nif? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
for the wonderful work that you're doing. Um, so my question basically is to say, I understand that you work, you, you, you're working with people who already have content, scientists or people living in the areas where the content is. But now, taking further from what he said, to say, can we also look at, I'll give you an example. We run schools development programs in Limpopo. We have a film school where we train young people in film and TV production, right? But the biggest problem we have is that we train and we're struggling to get the young guys who are now graduates to get something to do, mm. right? So could we look at a possibility of getting youth to present what you're doing to our guys to say, you don't have already content that you want, you can produce because you're not living around a, a, a park or there's no ocean in Mpopo, right? But can you be creative and think out of the box and think, up, uh, uh, think about creating content that has to do with nature conservation? Yes, I mean, we're not far from uh, Kruka National Park, but we don't have to be producing, you know, um, wildlife or, but within the space where we live, we can identify content that speaks to the work that you do. So I'm just saying, while you are working with people who live, who have content already, but need the skills, mm -hmm. but these are the people who have the skills and they need to be um, enticed yeah. to think about content that has to do with nature conservation. Thank you. Thanks, Mola. Um, just, to, just to say, I, I met Mola for the first time, where was it, in New York? Was it New York or was it Hong Kong? Oh, France, when we went to MUPCOM. Yes, that was the first time that, you know, it's crazy that we have to go overseas to meet each other. Uh, it's mad. Most of the friends that I have, Mr. P, I met overseas before I met. Yeah, it's, it's, it's mad, you know. Um, but yes, thank you for that. And it's a pity we didn't show that film. But there's a young, one of our first winners, when we sent the call out, is a young boy from, a young guy from Limpopo who dreamed of whales. He had never seen them. He had never, and he made a film about his dream of wanting to go and look at whales in Durban. And that's what his film was about. And his journey to go and see the whales, he gets there with the, with, and he doesn't get to see them. But you watch this film and you're holding for him. It's like, please, God, let him see the film. And he's falling in the boat and he's like, oh, God, I don't know what I'm doing here and whatever, you know. And now he wants to make the feature film of him going back and finally seeing the film, the whales. So what we're saying is there's no limit. There's no, you don't have to be the scientist. Guys, nature is all around us. Frogs irritate you and keep you up at night. That's a story. Okay, we have so many African superstitions. It's, that's a story about certain animals, about, about uh, you know, owls occur in our townships. Frogs occur in our townships. Um, uh, bats, earthworms. Um, you don't have to go into the park to tell the stories. It's not just about li wildlife. The N stands for nature. And that can be anything from a tree. I mean, I witnessed the thing. I, I have a good friend who's a scientist, a frog scientist. And she was, she's white. And she was taking this young guy, um, training him. And they're walking through the, through the wetland, and they stop, and he finds this frog. And she was so excited because it's endangered. And she's like, yo, and then she starts telling him about the frog. And I'm filming this, and it's so beautiful watching her, you know. And then we carry on through the swamp and carry on, and then we come to this tree. And then the roles reverse. He starts telling her about 
When somebody dies in an accident, we come and we take this tree. This tree is the most protected tree in our culture, because, and you will find that it's wild. It, it grows the most all over because we look after it. Because when somebody dies in an accident, the body has to be washed with this tree first before we can bury them. You know, and that's why as Africans we will always, and I stood there and I thought, five minutes ago she was the teacher. Five minutes later she's the student. You know, and that's the beauty of who we are and what we do, guys, as Africans. And those stories, we don't need to go into the park. Okay, these beautiful stories are right here. It's us and nature and the way we interact with them. And our grandmothers and our, you know, before it's too late, we must get them to tell those stories and to share that knowledge. Because that's what we've done. We've always shared knowledge orally. And other people have come and gotten rich on, those, on that information. We need to start telling those stories ourselves. You know, so please, that would be amazing if we can come to the guys who have graduated and say, guys, this is what's available. How can we include you? What can we do? Guys, we run labs all the time. We run underwater filmmaking labs. Okay? We run, we're starting what call cinematography labs from literally from the end of November. Okay? We're starting what we call cinematography labs in natural history, in wildlife. One of the if you want to make films for international companies, okay, the, bi the camera that is massive in natural history and in wildlife is a RED, okay, spelled R-E-D, okay, that's the one that costs 15 to 8, go and look on your rental sites and see how much is it a day to rent a RED, to red a, rent a RED helium, to rent a RED Komodo, okay, it's crazy, that's why we struggle to get access, okay, but and then that's the one thing. The other thing is when the international productions come to Africa, COVID has changed the game, guys, okay? They used to fly in, fly out, and then suddenly COVID said, uh-uh, stay at home. And the animals were doing the most and going wild, but there was no cameras here for us to film. There were no cameras for us to, okay? And we are saying, so, the first thing they ask when they say, we're coming to, to South Africa, or we're coming to Botswana, can you film on a red? Ish. How are you going to learn on a red if it costs 15 grand a day just to hire? Do you know what I'm saying? So what we are doing is we are starting cinematography labs. I went, I just come back from, from LA yesterday with two reds for training. Okay, and we invite especially women. Ladies, I'm tired of every time I'm looking for a cinematographer, a black ce female cinematographer, everyone says, do you know Huapi? That's all, hello, and then anybody else? She's so booked up you can't get access to her. Okay, it's an opportunity, ladies, to become cinematographers, okay? The we are, you can't just all be producers or only be in production, okay? There is an opportunity. We are looking for women that we can train, especially in cinematography. So, yes, who, 100%, and we'll come to you. Uh, can't wait. Deal. <laughs> Push it. Yeah. <laughs> Taking is not easy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, I am more interested in VR. VR. I saw a video there. So, like, it's, it's a wow. Like, um, I want to know the depth of it, how it all came about. Because looking at that video, what came on my mind was like, wow, during COVID, we... Oh, during COVID, we, we had that situation of we wanted to travel, we wanted to be on different spaces. Yeah, we wanted to be on different spaces and we couldn't because of COVID. So looking at this VR, we are able just by a snap travel and see the world 360 
the way it explains, right? Um, so I am more interested in that on what were you thinking and is it this about um, AI and what's the way forward? Uh, will it in coming years be out as the, there is an AR and there's a VR? So the difference between those two and which one will, will it be able to be kicked out in the market soon? Which one was they? Okay, so I'm not an expert in AR, VR, and all of that. Let me say that as a starting point, right? But as a keen follower of trends and what's happening in the industry, I can make comments, but I'm going to say that they are qualified comments because I'm not an expert, right? I'll go back just now to how we did our, con our Congress last year. But very quickly, in terms of the way forward, I think it's AI and, and VR. I think um, that they're going to complement each other. Okay, but I think as AI progresses and advances, um, the experience is going to become slightly different. It's going to become more real than maybe what VR is, is offering at the moment. I'm. And, and like I say, it's a hunch or a feeling that I have, but I could be completely wrong. I'm not an expert on that. But it is every year millions and millions of dollars is being put into that research and into moving that forward. Okay? So coming back to VR and filming in VR, okay? It's a very expensive exercise. Uh, I believe editing in VR is even harder and it's very specialized, okay? So if you can get into that, it's amazing. We, down the line, are going to look at bringing that kind of training in. And the reason why I say down the line is because, okay, those cameras are not as expensive as a red camera, okay? But the content and then the storytelling around it is kind of limited and the editing and that kind of stuff, etc. And there aren't a hundred or thousand productions taking place with VR every day. And for us, it's about creating jobs, f creating opportunities for jobs for you, etc. So our focus would more be on getting a red and training you up on a red versus getting a, 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 AR cam uh, a VR camera and training you up on a VR camera. So down the line, yes, we will, okay? And yes, you've got to keep abreast of the opportunities, I mean, of, of technology. You've got to, um, and there are amazing uh, opportunities that exist within that world. Very quickly with regards to our Congress last year, we, when, when the world was shutting down and everybody was terrified and didn't know what to do, the whole world was going to Planet Zoom. Okay, and we were like, the biggest challenge for me with Planet Zoom was people would put off their video, and then they're listening with one ear, and life is going on, and they're cooking, and they're listening, and their name is there, you know, but they're not really engaged. And so we were like, how can we get a platform that ensures, that forces people to participate, you know? How can we get, and so we saw this thing called social VR where it kind of encourages meets up, meetups. The challenge with that is the platform is not that strong. And obviously with South Africa's Wi-Fi challenges, it's a bit of a thing, but we took the risk. And the idea was we had our Congress in VR, where you create environments in VR, where you can create a cinema, okay? You, we created a cinema, we created a Amphitheater, like this room, but we created as an amphitheater in a rainforest uh, where all the talks took place and the panel discussions, etc. The audience were in the amphitheater, and instead of clapping, you can throw up hearts, you can throw up clapping hands, you can, you know. Uh, we had National Geographic Society's first ever photo exhibition in VR. Um, and then we had a networking sort of thing. 
And then to keep our personal touch and the bag that Mr. B was talking about was that we sent out this experiential pack or, um, you know, to everybody with popcorn, chips, your badge, uh, some drinks, you know, that kind of stuff. And then you were given this headset and you put it on, you walk in and you avatar. And then you decide how you look and it's got your name because you registered and that kind of stuff. If I see you across the room, I can point my thing at you to see what your name is if I'm not sure who you are. And then I can wave at you or greet you if I come and stand next to you. So I could be sitting in New York doing this and you could be sitting here, right? If I come and stand next to you, I can talk to you, okay? I can say to you, let's go to the movies. They're showing Uwan Le Lushile in the cinema at the moment, and we both go, as Mr. B was saying, we teleport and we go sit in the movies. Okay, and the other, and, and Mola says, no, 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 there's a big, there's an important talk in the amphitheater. And, and then somebody else says, no, let's go and look at the exhi exhi exhibition. You know, and so you were in this like real world Congress and whatever. It was amazing. Shit, it was hard. <laughs> okay, that's why we're not doing it again this year. Okay. It was hard, but we will continue to do. We're going to create. We're creating an environment where we can all meet up, because the world has changed, whether we like it or not, guys. The world has changed. Everybody's saying we're going to go back to normal. There's no normal. It's new. It's different. We. This happens so that we can change our behavior. It's our last, final written warning. If we don't, we're going to die. Okay. And so we have to change our behavior. And so. Um, the, we, we're going to create an environment where we can have meetups, where we can do training, where we can do screenings, where we can do exhibitions. And we're going to have a pool of headsets that we send out and bring around and back and forth, etc. But I think what we can do is, uh, thank you so much for all these questions. If anybody still has questions, can we go and have them, uh, can you ask them at the pool? area whilst we have some snacks and some drinks um, is there wine and beer as well Toby uh, one thing you'll learn about us is we work very hard but we play just as hard okay so please come and enjoy uh, a light snack and some drinks uh, and let's continue talking oh and I'll still give out some more of these over there okay <laughs> okay deal Thank you.